Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our second episode of webinar series 2022 by School of Architecture and Design Architecture Program. My name is Chianit Malichai, or you can call me Atom. And this is my pressure to be the moderator of this webinar on behalf of the School of Architecture and Design Architecture Program, King Mungkut's University of Technology, Thonbuli. This webinar is a second of four series focusing on the humanitarian design movement, architectural design in response to pandemic COVID-19. The similarity of design intervention during the crisis between Taiwan and Thailand. Architecture program webinar series 2022 is initiated to outreach and educate the public together with international professionals regarding school of architecture and design direction. Through the presentation of research and work by architecture program of School of Architecture and Design, KMUTT and our alliance. During the lecture, the video will be recorded, which will be available online. You may look out for the video in our Facebook page, School of Architecture and Design. And today I'm here with Dr. Acharat Wan Tutharat, Ms. Sonari Lawanyawat, and our international experts, Associate Professor Sheng Lun Shui, Associate Vice President for National Shengkun University General Affairs Office from Taiwan. So our theme today is about humanitarian design movement in response to COVID-19. Since 2019, our daily routine has completely changed. Due to the unexpected pandemic, many industries have to adapt. So does the architecture industry. Until today, the architectural perspective has changed to be more concerned with the effect of the pandemic of people and society. Today, we are fortunate to have our guest speakers to help us explore more on the example of the solutions. Now, let me introduce Ms. Sonali Lawanyawat, or Adan Bui, School of Architecture and Design, King Mungkut's University of Technology, Honburi. Adan Bui is teaching architectural design related courses and undertaking research at the Humanitarian Design Laboratory. Besides her bachelor's in architecture, she holds a Master of Architecture from Pratt's Institute from New York and a Master of Science in Urban Design from the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, from the U.S. She has been invited as a guest speaker at several universities in Thailand, Cambodia, and Japan. Today, Ajahn Bui will talk us through an interesting topic, which is Human, human Design Laboratory. Hello. Yeah, hello. so hello, hi, good uh, good morning, everyone. Um, very nice to have a chance to share um, our work with um, all of you. Yeah, so um, should I share the slide now? Okay, um, let me see. So um, my profile, like um, Atom has been um, introduced to everyone already. So basically, um, I'm an architect by practice. Right, so I never think about um, what I supposed to do as um, during pandemic time until like when everyone has to stop and then um, we could not go to work anymore, and um, even a normal practice might not have um, answer to to the problems that we all have. So by that, um, I started together with um, my colleagues, which is um, Ajahn Martin, right? So if you kind of hear, so I would just wanted to show that the project is actually a collaboration with um, um, Dr. Martin Chalk, which is a colleague of mine. And then there is um, a team from Field Robotics, which is, um, his name is Kuntosaporn and Kuntani, right? And also, we also have um, Tanwa, which is um, our research assistant, right? And then for today presentations, um, all the um, images is actually support by my son, which is his name is Anon Cho, right? So the project has been collaborations with um, Institute of Field Robotics, together with um, National Telecom and NSTDA, which is the Thailand National of Research Institute. And then the last one is actually like the um, engineering team and architect team of um, designs, the 20, uh, 21 designs, which is their specialist in um, hospital designs. Right? So yeah, like what I was saying that um, when we could not do anything anymore, the world has to stop within the last two years. So. Then I started to, to search by internet. I mean, we also like um, take a look at a lot of news and then we, we found out that 
Well, it seems like um, hospital in South Korea, they're very active to, to create a device or something to help um, medical team that um, if, if the medical team has to perform their work during crisis, um, what should be um, a support from designers, right? So we, we all hear the word social distancing, right? So I wanted to know what is the social distancing can be done by using architecture. And um, on the right hand side, you see that that's a picture from Thailand that um, what they did is um, in order to find that um, people has COVID or not. So, so you very need to define by swap tests or like they call RT-PCR methods of testing. So this testing has been done with drive through in Thailand. And then I see how the medical workers that they have to wear this um, protection um, shirts and then they kind of do the swap, perform the swap on the patients and it's actually very close. They have a very close contact and if you would see like the one on the right hand side, at that time they still did not use the PPE. PPE is a special suit that can zip the whole body like the one in, in South Korea, right? So, so that is actually like by the WHO standard that's supposed to be the, the very basic level of protecting yourself as a medical worker, right? So um, we did this um, today. I'm going to show you there will be two projects. One is called micro unit swap, swap test screening that is created out of the phone booth, public phone booth. And then the second one is actually like Eric or um, it's an outdoor clinic for consultations and the treatment for um, COVID-19 related case. So by taking a look at um, research, right, and then literature review, so we, we found out that, well, there is a um, natural ventilation type that um, the medical workers would wear the PPE suit. And that's what I was mentioned before, that this is the most basic way of um, how they can protect themselves. And then we found out that um, there's um, different methods that you can do. You either you create a screen to block, like after wearing the PPE suit, you can also have um, one screen or you can have like a U-shaped screen. And then um, there was some literature suggests on the medical um, treatment information that you can also use the fan and the fan should blow from your directions as a medical worker onto the directions of the patients, right? And that there's an option to use a negative chamber um, when you use air pressure to, to hold the um, so-called um, contaminated air, you can also have a negative chamber inside and then you put the patient inside and then um, the um, medical workers, it's actually marking by red persons, would be like outside. So all the contaminated air would keep inside the chamber. Or you can also do positive chamber. Positive means the air pressure inside the chamber is higher than outside. So if the medical workers is inside the chamber, so there would be so-called clean air and they could perform a lot of um, swap tests on that, on these matters. And then so either it's like they would be inside and then you can use um, natural fans or you can use um, um, air conditionings, right? So and then this is the methods that we select to build our research because of um, the, um, the PPE suit is actually very hot and then um, to perform these methods in the open air, it's actually outside in Thailand temperatures, it's, it's like a torture and um, a lot of medical doctors told us that um, they got sweat and then they could not focus and then could not concentrate on their work when they have to perform this um, matters in um, outdoor air quality, right? So by that, we put the uh, portable AC and the uh, HEPA. HEPA is a filter for virus, right? So we go to the next one. So that's why um, we got contact by the, the medical worker and then they told us that um, at that time of the wave one and wave two, they have to performed a swap test between 130 to 160 person per day. Um, and then everything finished very quick within two hours, right? So this is what they did by themselves at, um, at, the, at, at the institute that um, 
of course, like um, when the, the moment that they, they receive the PPE, so, the, so PPE was the only thing that they can protect themselves, right? And then they started to kind of have um, kind of small invention by using the, the PVC pipe and use those duct tape and then plastic to screen themselves, right? And then started to kind of invent from a one screen become a U shape. Right, and then they inform us that at this moment, the record that they have to do is actually 500 person per day, and the record is um, more or less 20% has a positive result, right? So now you can start to see that they started to, to use the fan to blow the air from their side onto the patient side, right? And I, I feel very sad when I, when I see this, and I feel like, well, as being a designer, um, at least we, we should step out and do something right so um this is the whole evolution of what happened in thailand right the ppe only um when they local started to, to put the pipe together and then put a the plastic screening and then they started to build a box right and then when the um, started to like i mean it's not only us who's actually um trying to to help out there was also a lot of people at a university as well so this one is actually in Jula that they, they, they create an um, acrylic box with negative chamber. And then um, there's EGAT, that is um, electricity company. They also do it with um, positive air pressure by using the fan. And then this is the last two, two process that actually this is our project. This is we use the air pressure and then we use the positive air pressures. Right? And then the last one is also our project that um, I'm going to show you later right so one more time like those air separation and then there is um an options that we can use and then um this is the last two um options that we actually selected for our for our work right what is the inspiration the inspiration is um we see a lot of phone booths that has been left out on the cities and even the bma they they got asked to remove those phone booths and um it's a very difficult to recycle as materials because um, it has an airtight as a properties and it's very heavy and it consists of many different parts of the materials that is very difficult to, to send it for recycle. So we contact the national telecoms and then we wanted to use this kind of um, a leftover type of objects and then how could these objects become something that um, can be useful, right? So we we got help by the staff of National Telecom that they, they pick it up, the, the, the certain type of designs, of, because phone boot also has many various, various designs. They pick it up, they clean it up for us, that they have um, special teams that they, they understand these objects very well. And then we send it to the local shop that normally they do um, body parts or automobile body parts, and then they they create the door, and then they create this um, cut out on on those um, phone booths for us, right? So then the, um, the first designs that we have is actually we we put together two cabins between the um, medical staff and the patients, and because we were thinking about that, um, it would be nice to have. Um, can have your privacy when, when you consult with doctors or when you do the swab test. And then after we sent out to one hospital and then the medical worker, the doctor told us like, look, um, this is a crisis time. Can you just make um, only the cabins for the medical staff and then um, reduce the surface of contaminations? And that's how we develop them into the final design that um, we secure only the medical team and then outside is actually patients would actually stand with um, natural ventilations, right? And we did a bit extra on the um, graphic designs because we noticed that people who come for a test, they're not um, reading, there might be a group of people who cannot read Thai. So we wanted to make sure that there is a um, graphic language that can communicate with them and then they, it's the English and then they are Thai as a language, right? So 
because of um, trying to insist on using on this um, phone booth because of the circular economy concept that um, something should be able to reuse in, instead of always ask for the new materials, right? And then we install the positive air pressure machine and then the HEPA filter for the virus filter and put the air conditioning. That's what I was mentioned that um, it's it's nicer temperature for for work uh, for medical workers to perform their work in the outdoor in the outdoor area. The movable movable platform help to to bring these boots from from place to place and rubber glove of course. And then um, the Fibos team they suggest that you also have a microphone and a speaker. So by that um, the medical teams can. The staff can communicate with the people when they perform those um, swap tests, right? How they how we combine the object together. Um, the the red part is actually or the new part because um the original materials of the glass is actually temper glass, so we cannot cut do any cut hole on those objects. So it has to change replace it with um, acrylic. Um, materials in order to to have those device right and then below it's um, a movable platform that it's not only for moving but it also has to fix um, on the ground when when they use right so you know like um after we we produce them each time it's always a fight whether we should create by using all new materials because um, we did a comparison that in the lower part you can see like if you build everything from the new materials everything would be much faster right and and then um, you use less manpower but uh, the top bar is to show that from collecting from the place and then if we have to send it for cleaning the nt team the national telecom would help us to clean and then bring it to local it take longer it takes 20 days to build and then the distance involved is actually 96 kilometers nine manpower but why we still insist on that because of um the this looping of um circular economy we we intended that well why not if it's a little bit more time but it's great more people who involve more jobs opportunity give to people and then you can also help the environment that um things that always use just one time and then become uh, trash why not trying to create the value out of trash um, in the society and then if, and if um is it a commercial purpose might be difficult but this is because of the um, academic institute so we should stand for this concept right so this is a comparison between um, a circular economy concept or if we use the um, new material to build right and then everything would send to um, FIBO for inspections right so this so this is how the, the picture to show you that uh, the FIBO team of fused robotics from KMTT they were helping on install the machine and of course the most important is to test the air tide and the positive air pressure right so this is how it looks and then we test it out like what if the wheel need to be able to push and at the same time like how different terrains and then how does it work and then what was the problems right and we get um the team staff of um the garden team of kmutt that they help us to deliver to each of the health institutes right and it was very heavy very intensive and then when we go there like everything has to be very quick because um we don't want to interfere the medical process right so we bring it you can see like um later after the first four boots then we put we design this bar that's just easier for them to guide and to move those objects into the different surfaces to see like the various surfaces that everything has to install right and then sometimes um the floor is not even so by that that is this cups that is hold them in the position that was very important and then um, we even go there to explain the procedures of um, medical doctor that if they're going to use it which one should they do and then different parts and then we produce the um, the manual guide for them in the video how they can use it right and then that's how it's in place how it has been used on site 
right? And this, those are the pictures that sent back by the medical team that um, how they use it to perform over. Um, this is more or less like two years that has been sent in. Um, afterwards, we did a survey um, with them to find out because we wanted to know like the nature of use. If we, if we send something out in public, we wanted to know like um, how how has been used, right? So this is um, in the capacities in the average of two years or so per month, right? So you can see like all the, um, the first group that are in the city centers of Bangkok, right? And then um, we found the interesting patterns of the, the cube number five, number six, 11 and 12, you can see that there are higher number of capacities that can serve or people that come to, to receive the um, RT-PCR test, right, with um, the, the phone boots that we, that we give it to them. It showed that um, this is might be suitable for outside Bangkok with um, more of the green space that um, people who live outside Bangkok and then they, they need those basic treatment. Right. So if you live um, in the city centers, you have a lot of choice and then you have um, various kind of hospitals that you can go. Right. But then um, this this phone booth is actually like um, very, very basic to help out. And they, they seem to have a chance to serve caters a bigger number of people when it's actually outside um, Bangkok or even like other province like here in Batum Thani. And then actually here it's actually in um, Ganjanaburi. And that's um, the average is 8,500 persons has been used this per month. Right? And that's why the nature of settings to show that um, this is the photo that's sent back to us by one of those um, institutes. And then they say like the way they, they set it out is actually like in the landscape outside. And the people who come for, for the test are people who has a close contact or have someone in their family that um, has COVID. So there's a very high risk group of, of people who request it or have to go for under investigations, right? So, so that was the first part of the micro unit to help by using the concept of circular economy. And then the second one was a little more serious that um, it's a complete designs based on the similar principle, similar concept of positive air pressure and um, HEPA filter to make um, social distancing between the medical and the, um, the patients, right? So we wanted to draw the line. We wanted to save the medical staff in the crisis and then what can be done, right? So, so that's how we develop further. And then we found out that um, the Ministry of Public Health released um, the video and then we draft out the video as a diagram to, to see like the process of if you wanted to receive the treatment with um, respiratory problems, like you have sore throats, you have your cough, you have fevers, and you wanted to know whether you have COVID or not, they have a procedures to, to screening and then they have the word PUI or patients under investigation. So not that everyone would have COVID, you know, like um, other type of sickness, it's also still an ongoing um, in the society. So by that you have to go through the, the first, you have to register, you have to get um, questionnaires to evaluate whether you are the PUI or non-PUI and then you go through the process of treatment. So with this type of process, we feel like, well, maybe one swap test is actually designed is not good enough. So what if we try to understand this diagram and then why don't we kind of creating further help, further support. So from the registrations, then you separate the patient into PUI, which is a patient under investigation or the non-PUI. You can also, because you have an allergy or you have a normal flu symptoms, then by that you become a non-PUI. And then when it's non-PUI, then you go for consultation, talk to the doctor, you do the payment or you do the paperwork for your insurance and then you get medicines, right? And then you can just go home. But if you are patients under investigation as has um, direct contact with a person with COVID, then you need consultations 
of course, filing for paperwork, insurance, and then you receive the, um, the test kit, and then you go for the swab test, and then that would be um, Thailand has um, this registrations follow up of um, um, by the mobile phones, right? So that's kind of methods that is a complete operations for standard operation procedures that's based on the Ministry of the Public Health Policy. So with that, we did the diagram again. Um, we're very keen on like we wanted something to design after we designing it we want people can understand how this whole thing would work how it look like and also create a bit of the, um, a friendly atmosphere as well as to communicate with people so that's how we adapt the idea of positive air chamber become an um, eric or like the accurate respiratory infection clinic Right. This is under the research fund of National Science and Technology Development Agency. So to have them as a cubicle that um, it's that um, the whole medical team can perform outside, um, separate from the existing hospital, because we, the hospital still receive a lot of visitors that they are elderly. They come with other type of sickness, like high blood pressure, diabetes, and then how to be able to separate the um, respiratory problems from other disease, then the best is that you separate by the organization of the space. And that's why we invented or we, we do the research on this project. And then um, first we have lined up everything in one surface and then um, it doesn't be able to fit on the track that um, they can deliver easily. So by that, um, we change it that um, there is a site in the front and then in the back end also that um, people can use as a um, so-called process and the functions. Right? And um, the manual guide, how people can clean, how they can take care of all the equipment. So now all the air equipment and the air supplies actually from, from above and how everything can lift up and um, can transport from location to locations by using um, the six wheel truck, right? And it's even go further for the certifications for the clean room standard of air tightness and positive air pressure by the company that um, usually they certify the hospitals um, air tightness and the positive chambers. So this is the interior space of the space for the whole team of the medical staff, right? Um, there is some um, separations between the contaminated corridor of the patients that come to to receive the treatment and then the clean corridor is at the back right so pathways is very important how the diagram has been put together that people would understand the um, sequence of service right and it's um it's filing even go further for the um, copyright on the um, design right um, to show you the situations of how it's been um, easy to transport. This is very important. And then how it's installed in um, Mehong Son, right? Uh, Mehong, um, it's our season one hospital. Right? Before this unit, we have tested out on two modules and then that was donations to um, Leung Nokta Hospital in Yasothon. And then this is a complete one that um, installed at uh, Mehong Son. Um, province, which is in the border to Myanmar. Right. So afterwards, after it has been used, and then um, we contact back to them that um, we wanted to know how the product has been helped other people, and then what kind of um, so-called conflict and earlier has been done with the designs that um, we still want to know. Um, so this is just recently, um, last month, that we sent our photographers to take photograph and um, the service has been performed, right? Okay, so this is the conclusions that we found out after we, we give this whole thing to them. Um, we found out that accessibility is a problem. Um, they add up those steps. This is a very, um, complex issues that when we did the designs, we want the patient to stand 
to to talk to the medical staff who's sitting inside the um, height of the um, cubicle the interior height is actually 30 centimeter higher than the outside right so by that um, it's kind of a, a quick contact of talking and then um, be able to to change different to different locations right a different process of treatment but then since like in reality when they when they use it on service they they create this um, platform and then they offer the chair for people to to sit and then discuss with doctor right or even like for payment or finance um, issues so by that um, they have to install those um, steps which we feel like it's, it's a bit trouble because this step is also stop um, for wheelchair access into into this um, service right and then the, um, the second major so-called um, things that happen is like we found out that they constantly change the number of the of the 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 organizations of how they they give the service and then by interview they told me that um well in some situations for example they also use it for the medical health check for visa applications of the the laborers like um from neighbor countries from Myanmar right so in one week they certify this health check on um, people who might not have any record on the vaccine so by that um, they need to increase the um, cubes for legislations right and they reduce um, the medical supply um, channel so by that they constantly has to change the number according to the um, different situations that um, in service and sometimes when the, it was a peak time for COVID, so the swap test, they use um, additional cubes for swap test as a separate line. And then they install more doctors into, into this um, so-called um, the, the channel, right? So by that um, found out that would have been nicer that those numbers would create like um, plastic pockets and then they can slide in the printout. So by that they could change the um, so-called standard operation procedure, then the designs could be better. So this is like to show for anyone who might take a look at it and they you wanted to kind of um, do a better design. So this is what you can learn from it, right? So that's so far from our work. So what tomorrow will be, for designers, I think um, number one, life change permanent, permanently that change. Like we, we actually see house as also being the place for work. So I say like this is this is going to have an influence on the um, architecture practice. We work from home, right? We we do concern a lot on um, health and hygiene, right? So all those surfaces that you can clean the way how you procedures of how you clean the space, this become very important for us to, to know, right? And um, there is um, movement on sustainability. We also know that self-sufficiency is very important. We, um, on the construction side that um, when you con wanted to construct something and you want to use the materials during um, pandemic or even post pandemic, there is the um, shortage of the supply on the, um, the equipment that you can use, like a lot of materials cannot be delivered to Thailand because of the, um, the pandemic problems, so transportation is a problem. So by that, it's better to trying to use the materials that is actually produced in your own country, right? Air conditioning or natural ventilation. Now we all know that air conditioning is also like um, can transmitting the disease when it's in the closed area. So it's actually better to have a natural ventilation, to have a natural ventilation that is good for health. You also need to, to work over, right? Well, there is a um, great emphasis on privacy, right? So um, every community space like gym, swimming pool, we would all have to think twice when we wanted to use it. We everyone's kind of um, into the um, living with um, 
more separate in the sense of like wanted to secure their privacy. I mean, there was a case on condominium that um, someone got um, COVID and then the share elevator become part of um, area that can spread out the disease, right? So, so by that privacy become something that is concerned. Touchless society, that is also like um, something that we need to think about um, as an architect. Access to nature, if we live separate for so long, we feel like um, we all wanted to see nature because it brings a positive sense of us. So altogether, density regulations would get affected, minimal space requirement or shared space and rule and regulations. So this is going to influence the future of architectural design, right? And I think um, whatever come as a problem, as being a designer, there is a room for design improvement. So that would be um, from us, from the um, SOAD School of Architecture and Designs, KMUTT, on what we did in the last two years, according to humanitarian design movement. So thank you. Thank you, Ajahn Pui, for your incredible insights on Human Design Laboratory. And Ajahn Pui will be back with us again for the Q&A session. Thank you, Ajahn Pui. So um, next, I would like to introduce you to the next speaker from Taiwan, Associate Professor Sheng Lun Shui, the Department of Architecture and Associate Vice President for General Affairs, National Shenggun University from Taiwan. He is also an architect and urban designer interested in embodied resilience and cinematic thinking in Taiwan, in exploring the social relationships within the Asian environment. Sheng, uh, Mr. Sheng Lun Shui has an Master in Architectural and Urban Exploring the, and sorry, and Urban Design from Columbia University and a Bachelor in Architecture from National Shenkun University, where he works as a thesis studio coordinator in student event associate professor will provide us on the insight about the architecture of the contract zone or prophylactic in architecture in National Shenkun University. Hello. 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 Thank you for inviting me to participate in this event. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you well. Okay. Let me see how do I control this. Hold on one second. Okay, I saw it. Okay. Hello, my name is Chen Dun Xue. I'm Associate Professor of Architecture at National Chenggong University in Tainan City, in Taiwan. I went to New York to start in 1996, where I met Ajahn Pui Sanari and Ajahn Martin also, and began a 25 years friendship with them. In this presentation, I will show projects I did in our university campus to discuss it the experience of Taiwan as a pandemic bubble and Taiwan's collective response to the pandemic, framing the present crisis within this big scale geopolitical and small scale personal history and actions. So I hope to understand better also for you, the differences between Taiwan and maybe Bangkok's response to COVID-19 especially in this current elevated tension between China and, and Taiwan, and also in between this rocky US-China relationship. In the post pandemic, we are already very much aware and are paying a lot of attention on the zone of contact, the contact of the virus. I hope my projects can also, I, I found my project has many, many similarities with the Professor Sonnery's uh, presentation. And, and I hope my project can also inspire new viewpoints to understand how social experiences and actions on this, on our particular kind of island, the Taiwan island, can be responsive to the question of what is architecture of the contactless Okay, let me go to the 
Historically, the geopolitical significance of Taiwan lies in its strategic location and is in between on and off relationship with global trade and war. Those instability, uncertainty has been the focus of my research and interest to explore more adaptive and resilient design in Asia environment and participate in various international academic groups, including the KMUTT, like the event in last year's 3R event, DIA Design Resilience in Asia event. And I'm interested in exploring not only the, the, the changing states of water system in the urban design, but also those dynamic social, cultural, and technological practice in the built environment. Crisis in the environment, conflict in the geopolitical relationship, context in the pandemic, all made us better prepare for exploring the resilience in the design. In 2020, several architects and urban designers created a series of Instagram posts with the hashtag Urban Urbanism Beyond Corona. Professor Keller Easterlin from the Yale University overlapped the Taiwan on top of the New York Tri-State Area map. To compare the, these two islands, one is Taiwan Island, one is Manhattan Island, with similar area and similar population, about 25 million, and similar infrastructure length of the railroad, of the distribution network. Yet, at the time of the post, there were only four COVID deaths in Taiwan. But while there, there, there were more than 40,000 deaths in the New York City region with physical distancing lockdown. But the life in Taiwan remained relatively normal without any major shutdown. Taiwan was like X-ray machine, revealing the deaths and not just from the virus, but, but this pandemic, the deaths caused by the pandemic also from the racism, unjust, unequal labor resources, unequal medical care, and ineffective special governments. I moved back to Taiwan in 2006 and start, started teaching in NCKU. The pandemic also gave me the opportunity to co-work with my former professor, Brian McGrath in New York, and to compare two islands, both are kind of my homeland, and 12 hours time difference, 8,000 miles apart. We integrated design digital method and reflection to help capture fleeting micro histories from Taiwan in the pandemic. We both believe the adaptive resilient responses are correlated to the characteristics of the island democracy. Neutral through the island context and the fortification geopolitical struggle instabilities and indeterminacy. We feel they are all connected. So the concept of the contact zone was introduced by the mayor, Louis Pratt. He's a social scientist. And he referred the contact zone as a social space where different cultures meet, clash, and grapple with each other in the context of the Spanish territorial colonialism. Also, contemporary island studies also call for a recentering or focus away from the discourse of the conquest of the mainlanders 
giving voice and platform for the expression of the island narratives. As you already know, the contact zone in Taiwan are as island as opposed to those the previous colonism. There are there are more areas, there are more territorial, and contract. Contrary to the entities in Latin American or Silk Road, they are all continu con continuous and the expansion without a fixed boundary. The oxymoron characteristics of the isolation by linking natures were related to the islands. In the center of the, this first chain of archipelago outside the East Asia mainland. And Taiwan has been through multiple colonial regimes in history, Dutch, Spanish, Chinese, Ming Dynasty, Qing, Qing Dynasty, and then Japanese, Chinese Nationalist Party, and then democratic government right now. Using the natural landscape or man-made fortress, trying to create the bubble as protection and as filter for the cultural clash. The picture here shows the map. They are depicting the inner sea, the harbor landscape in Tainan city, where the, our university is located. The Tainan was the first settlement city in Taiwan 400 years ago. Our university is just right located in the center of the Tainan city. I'm going to show a little bit uh, fabric. It, this is the map showing the layered historical fabric in Tainan city. The frequent transfer of the colonial and imperial powers that separate the island from the previous regime connect to the new status quo with China have been accompanied by many conflicts, cultural clashes, wars. The original city wall was demolished one by one, and the modern Greece and the boulevards were cut through the old street fabric and becoming blocks and districts as new bubble uh, during the Japanese colonial periods for control or uh, for fortification or for the more hygiene cities. This is my family tree mapping as a concentric structure, like a uh, generational bubble within bubbles. My ancestors were the first generation of the mainland Chinese who emigrated from the Southern China during the Ming Dynasty in the 17th century. The family's clam house was constructed over time in Kaohsiung city, the south of Tainan, around 350 years ago. It is a traditional residential building as in Southern China, this kind of building type. And there are three consecutive courtyards and central halls that are now only used for major ceremonial events, display portraits and memorial tablets of several key ancestors. The courtyard are bubbles within bubbles and within the bigger bubbles, protecting the center hierarchical social structure against the, those outside encounters, conflicts, and special transformation from the surrounding area. There, there, there were pirates or Aboriginal tribes, other mainlanders, military and government, different governments in the outside of this compound. Shifting scale and layers of the generational or genealogical relationship helped me to explore my transnational identity. And I'm migrating in between two homeland islands, Taiwan and Manhattan. One is the family bounded hierarchical order in Taiwan, it's very family centric. And the other in Manhattan is a very nuclear American dream in Douglas and Queens. My elder daughter was born in New York 
and went back to New York for her college education in 2019. Immediately after the outbreak and school lockdown in New York, she returned to Taiwan and continued with online courses in March 2020. She was considered a highly contagious risk for us because at that time we don't know, uh, know a lot about the virus at all. Not only was she required the 14 days quarantine, but with plastic sheets, we DIY a quarantine bubble to create a contactless zone in a car and within our apartments. Between her room and the, our apartment corridor, I created a bubble, a bubble, a buffer zone also for exchange food and goods. You open one side each time only to maintain the proper enclosure and can have limited interaction. Later, I'm going to transform this, this concept of the buffer into our design. She had no leg, no jet leg shifting to digital space in her little bubble constructed in our apartment, which actually was operated in the New York Times zone for her online classes in the US. Later, she even enrolled in the NCKU to have physical and normal social life, to make friends and eat lunch with her friends in Taiwan. The little bubble in the apartment is an extra territorial island and a very special contact zone uh, was wired between two colleges. One is Taiwan NCKU, one is American college with a 12 hours temporal difference inside and outside. Although she spent her childhood in the US, she became a young adult in Taiwan when the social interaction of the new generation shifted to the digital space. So she was very used to this kind of the uh, meta space. The Sunflower Student Movement in 2014 in Taiwan, then Umbrella Movement in Hong Kong, and the, even the last year's student protests in Thailand have raised a lot of awareness of their generation with more democratic, participatory, decentralized or mobile and adaptable capabilities. And it's known as the Milti Alliance. The, the, those countries with the Milti, including Taiwan and Thailand. And in the past year, Taiwan Island the happy bubble was burst several times. The national measure of elevating quarantine restrictions, broaden COVID testing, identify hotspot areas. There are many measures. Also some are uh, related to the, the space of contactless, imposing the social distancing and limiting group gathering, prohibiting indoor dining and activities, working from home, like Professor Sonnery just mentioned, controlling the flows in the public space and separating space into quadrants by temporary dividers. There are many, many ways. But besides the, these top-down measures in epidemic management, from the local bottom-up approaches, island community has come pandemic narrative can suggest more flexible and adapt adaptable approach. Taiwan has experienced the shortage of the vaccine last year. Vaccine politics is not only tied to the global inequality of wealth and power for Taiwan, it is also about siding with international alliance against China's oppression, against China's bully. Using autom Automotive chips, these microchips, we, we bargain with Germany and, and in order to get the doses of vaccines. And also besides the US, Japan and other 
its European countries also started to donate vaccines to Taiwan last year. In return for the favor from Taiwan's donation of med medical masks earlier uh, two years ago. So it is not just fixed strategy of quarantine, dividing, separating or distancing, but it's about to negotiate, to adapt, to just oppose, to make alliance, to mediate between contact and contactless. The button up communities self-discipline to wear masks, maintain contactless, recall footprint, be aware of service contact with the use of the disinfectant, and so on and so on, rather than the total lockdown proved to be effective. At NCKU, amid the global pandemic crisis in April 2020, when Taiwan still resumed a normal life in the island bubble, we start to mobilize resources among university, the university hospital, and professors and students at the architecture department and collaborated with the local architect, consultant, and contractor to develop the construct two projects. Working to, together with the architect office, it was done in three days using the same as the Professor Sonnery's ideas, circular and reassemblable, local, modular, and lightweight material. And this construction system was very commonly used in Taiwan as a construction site office. The plan, let me see. The plan shows the very basic module with two negative pressure walls with shared uh, enter room, the best view. One side is clean corridor for the doctor and nurses. The other side is dirty corridor for patients and waste materials. So this module can combine, duplicate it and combine into elongated cluster to accommodate more, more patients. And we even uh, make this as an open source project. And the beam model, airflow control, technical specifications, and manual are all shared online for free in a hope to help those in need for emerging construction of the negative pressure world in time for the collapsed healthcare systems. So this is what's the, like the first trial. And after that, among various disciplines at the university architecture department and university hospital, we started to experiment how to create modular unit. They can be quickly de deployed during the post or during the pandemic crisis. Modular can be combined into different architectures to enhance the anti-epidemic capabilities for existing buildings and other places in need. It's like a Lego blocks and put together for different function and different use. So it's just to show the, the module will classify by functions and can have more specific design, different kind of design and capabilities for different needs. Uh, for example, the, the, this add-on module can be a bathroom add-on or can be the vestibule. view. And the partition or wall or also can be designed and accommodate different design for different needs. And even we can have more detailed design and prefabricate it and be quickly assembled on site. So we try to, the initial design is to build this prototype with one negative pressure ward and one negative pressure lab and one nursing station and one testing service station. And the plan, and, and you can see the plan with two this yellow and orange part is kind of vessel view. We divide this vessel view into two levels of the, the end room design. And 
take a closer look. You enter from the zone yellow into the wall, red co color with a red color room and exit to the orange color zone. So, so it's a one loop without overlapping with the, the, the circulation. And the West PP suite protection clause will be discarded through the middle collection trash box uh, shown in the gray color and processed in a dirty corridor. Between the clean zone and the, the, the wall, we design a small area uh, with sheer anti erode growth and windows is for performing the regular check-in and even the x-ray uh, without entering the wall. So this is uh, for better protection to the doctor and nurse. It's a similar idea to the, the buffer zone outside my daughter's bedroom. So using this concept, uh, adopting the modular principle, we then dis decide to construct a real testing station first without building the whole 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 unit we just build the the testing the swap test testing station first and uh, one of the testing modules is an enclosed testing room for chest x-ray examination linked to the ai imaginary systems because one of the professor uh, he's doing their, their team is doing this this ai imagery system to help identify possible infectious cases uh, very quickly. Uh, because at that time, the PCR testing maybe takes two days or, or, or even longer, depends on the, the testing cases. So, so doing the, using the X-ray is, is a kind of supplemental way to, to decide which is the confirmed case. So our idea also is to think in summary design. We are, we are thinking to fit in the recycled container for the best mobilities. This shows the exploded diagram. So you can see we have three testing rooms and one with the X-ray capabilities. And, and here you see the operation of the station, the circulation was separate in the beginning through the screening and and the, for the early symptoms. And then the X-ray for identifying possible cases as early as possible. The X-ray testing room has a, a more enclosed space. It is also equipped with the equipment with a, uh, another professor. Uh, his design, his research team is developing the photodynamic sterilization that can kill the viruses with diffused dyed mist and the high power light source uh, quicker than the, the ultraviolet sun, the light. So the, the, I'm going to introduce the current finished unit. We call it M. container that combine the mobile COVID and the container three words together. It is a station for the swap test. And also uh, uh, actually is an experiment carrier allowing all kinds of research teams to conduct field operations and verifications with their innovative idea and anti-epidemic related technology and experiments. They can all conduct it in our, in our containers. The whole unit should be prefabricated, ready to be transported and adaptable to for different scenario and applications. So this is what it looks like. It maintained the, the as a original uh, container. It's typical twenty foot container and can be quickly deployed and set up to operate the in minutes where it is needed. And the same as the in the summaries design. It's a micro positive pressurized bubble and operated through its three airtight window counter units and can be closed to create a physical barrier and, and also equipped with a modularized fan and sterilization equipment. So those fans provide positive air pressure 
inside the container and also good ventilation by adjusting the different fan speeds and also cool down a little bit uh, by sending cool air to the outside counter area. And like we also have a, a service design team to help and and we, we also design like a, a procedure. And so after the COVID testing, the specimens are encapsulated in a toy-like gasoline ball. I, I don't know if you all uh, play with this gasoline ball that Japanese, they, they have all kinds of toys and gizmos inside this ball. And so we make purposely make the, 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 the capsule like a toy and it can be rolled rolling through the tube and collect it for the further lab testing. So the whole process deliberately become a fun game to reduce the psychological stress and caused by the procedure. So this is the picture on site. It's outside our university hospital and have performed, even today is performing the, the swap testing even today. But uh, after, after we, we did this, this container, container project, we also co-work with professor in the mechanical engineering field to conduct the research on the thermal and fluid mechanism to, 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 to try to understand better of the, how the air is moving inside our container, inside our testing area. So using this CFD model, computational theory dynamics model, and reverse engineering method, we experiment with the enclosed prototype to check if it can effectively block the external airflow, so make the, the air inside the enclosure safe. And we also that, like, try to collect the feedback from the, the real, real use and also uh, designing and developing the lighter version uh, for the better movement of doctors and nurse, all this medical staff. So this is like a, a combine the, the, this original container design and, and has some extension and to, to extend this um, more mobile uh, testing station and with just semi enclosed bubbles, not the full enclosed bubble. So you can see the a little bit diagram and sections. So the people, the doctors at lens, they can move in and out more easily. And with this semi enclosed uh, bubbles, we we are guaranteed to we are because after studying the airflow inside this semi enclosed bubble, we are very sure is. The, the outside air is not is not going to mix with the the inside air within this semi enclosed bubble area. So this is a test we are doing conducting with the real one to ten scale models, and through the mutual verification of different airflow models and temperature measurements, we we can identify the suitable model for the for the the, the analyzing this airflow and make sure it's the, the, the safe, safe airflow enclosure, even it's semi-open. So the experimental result shows is very effective and, and it's very kind of successful. And later we even uh, adopt this key design concept of this motorized fan like by controlling the speed of two fans to create an unequal air pressure. So it can be adapted to other applications, even in the buildings. So for example, the, it can adapt easily uh, to the security booths. And so, so the, you don't need to build the new, new swap test stations. You just need to convert and using two windows and one is stronger fan and one is uh, a little bit weaker fan to control the speed to create the unequal pressure. And even you can use this kind of system 
to the we we use this system into the our NCKU dormitories rooms, and even have idea to convert the unused the military dormitory into the quarantine centers. So so by carefully uh, control the positive or negative air pressure, you you can create positive for medical staff and and use the negative pressure for patients and so to to make sure the 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 space is is safe for the 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 nurse and the doctors and later we also a uh, very quick uh design beer project uh with students is a diy quick test stations and it's a zigzag translucent barrier become like an interface not just dividing each other, but you can a little bit see each other, talk to each other, but still with, with, with a safe uh, barrier interface. Okay, it's coming to the, the last slide. This is the last slide. So geographer Professor Andrew Cliff and Peter Hager suggested epidemics are patterns in time and space. We architects are experts at patterns in space and time. The top-down measures as well as button-up approaches and also the narrative for our everyday resilient responses, they are all important. The architecture of contact zone that can adapt to waves of vulnerabilities, a multi-systematic relationship from the human body to the bigger scale planetary movements that are responsive to the social and ecological transformations. So I hope the project that that can inspire new viewpoint uh, for all the uh, audience today. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sue. The project you have presented was very interesting and helpful. So now we are moving on to the last discussion panel, the Q&A session. So if anyone has any questions or curious about their work, you can leave us a comment or a question in the chat box for the discussions. And we'll be back in a few seconds. Thank you. Okay, so we are back. And um, should we begin the first questions? So now we have Ajahn Pui and Professor Chue together. Yep. So the question I got from the ground from um, Tanakrip is that the question for Ajahn Pui, ha, considering COVID in Thailand, is there any recommendations for the new building design and public building design? Um, I says like, um, yeah, we kind of has to consider of um, the um, air quality. I think air quality is a very, very big problem, right? That um, we used to um, take care of the air quality by just um, make us feel comfort with the good temperatures. And now we have to think about like air filter. Right. And I think um, Thailand is not only facing problems with um, COVID-19, we also have PM 2.5. So this air filter and then increasing the air quality become like a very important that um, when you turn on the AC, you need to have like a fresh air intake into the space, right? Um, that's because of the pandemic. So you wanted to kind of filter, um, always bring in the fresh air, but then um, now, because of the PM 2.5, so the air, fresh air that you bring in, it actually has um, problems with pollution. So you need to filter it. So I think um, the air quality becomes something that affected of every building and also every public building. Okay, thank you for your answer. I hope that uh, I hope that Tanakrit would 
would could adapt that into his design in your class. <laughs> and yeah, and we have the next question for Professor Shue. So based on the hospital design for National Shenkun University, how did you test the design like the prototype and who would participate in the design and will the design change in the future if the COVID disappeared? Yeah, that's that's a, a question we, we, we are asking ourselves too. <laughs> because we have uh, our president of the university, basically she, she put the, the cross-disciplinary team together. So including the, our university hospital, the many doctors were involved in the projects and, and especially also from our architectural department, several professors and uh, that I mentioned in the presentation, the, me the professor from mechanical engineering, so to to have better research on the air dynamic air flows, and all the the participants, we are also asking the same questions like, what like if after the 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 we are coexisting with the COVID nineteen and and what happened to the our design so so we are kind of thinking that the like the container because we purposely make it toy like so we want to maybe it would be deployed back to the the community park or or in the certain public uh, spaces and it becoming like a, 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 a like a kind of the lens part of the landscape design and it creates some functionality, different function is for play. And for also reminding us that these two, three years of uh, suffering of two, three years of crisis of suffering from the, the COVID-19. And, and, and also that the Professor Sonnery just mentioned, probably they are, they are the, the it kind of inspire new design for the every building now because we now need to focus more on the airflow and focus more on the the quality the ventilation becomes very important because the density of the virus really affect the the spread spreading of the the virus it depends on the density and how good of the ventilation is so so I think that many part of the because our our project actually is a kind of carrier for all kind of discipline of professors doing their research. So so this can be like developed into different other things. So not 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 that I, I don't think this this we call it container will remain as fixed object in the future it just it will evolve and develop into new things and embed it or become part of the building design or other research or for use in the other research teams like like that professor summary mentioned your project was used for like a visa check or other kind of purpose so the adaptability and the, the is is also kind of the the concept, the key concept for the resilient design. So that is what I, I think is the most important. Okay. Thank you for your answer. And we also got another question from our um, professor at, at our university from Dr. Martin, that <laughs> is it possible for us for, for SOAD student that we could visit your national university? Again? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> because yeah. but now now the in Taiwan, if you enter Taiwan, you need to have quarantine for a week, I think. That's like three days. Oh. Three days in a in a quarantine hotel. Oh but the four yeah. days in the in, in your in your other residence. So yeah. so it's still a long quarantine time. Oh, okay. So but we so we wait. Yeah, but otherwise you can come in time. Yeah, I mean, last time we went for workshop and it was yes. very, very nice, very impressive. Like, um, um, become one of the most um, favorite 
countries of um for our students mm -hmm. they love they love especially Tainan it's a very very beautiful city yeah. that's why I, I I want to I wanted to to talk about Tainan a little bit more in the previous presentation I hope it's not too much uh, so, this is good. So for yeah. for the student to understand Tainan city a little bit better Mm. But, but actually, I want I, I will visit you in November. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yes. For the workshop in, in yes, Bangkok. Yes. Yes. Yeah, hopefully. That's nice. Yes. yes. Uh, yeah. We all hope to see you here too. And uh, here's a question from me to you, um, Mr. Shen Shui. So, like, from your opinion, after introducing us to these amazing projects, what are the most important changes that you think the adaptation of the this pandemic could benefit the future architecture designs? Like in what way and how? For example, what what do you think will people be more concerned about health related issues to in their design? Yeah. So actually, the professor Sanari already like at the end of her presentation has <laughs> answered the question already. But I I might add a little bit in the conceptual level because i i the, the reason i in my early the, the, in my presentation the 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 have first part of my presentation is about this conceptual idea about the the contact and the contactless and so conceptually i i was hoping then we realize uh we have more awareness of uh between this contact and contactless and so in response to this kind of conceptual idea that that our actions in architectural field is is becoming more decentralized and becoming toward more democratic and more participatory like the professor summary's project do, is doing so that that's what i i think that's that's more important. But the other part the Professor Sanari's presentation has, has, has told them all already. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you for answer that questions. And now like I have the question for Jan Pui as well. So for now we have resilient design architecture, which is the design that responds to extreme weather. And we consider it a lot when designing buildings. Since we have experienced it quite often in, in like every country. However, unlike COVID-19 situation where it's very new to us that now we are learning to adapt to it. Do you think that from now on we should also consider it as a primary factor when designing any types of buildings? Mm -hmm. well, um, well, I I kind of think like um yeah like the business like the, the building if it's kind of like something to do with business it's it's um they would try to go back like business as usual right so so they would get um, more people to 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 take care of the space uh, more system that trying to to get into like um to make to maintain the, um, the hygiene of the building but um i think what i what i what I kind of my concern is um, some of um, academic institutions, for example, like school, right? U school for young children or universities, right? I think um, it is so important that um, we come to the school, we come to the university because we want to to socializing, right? You wanted to eat with your friends, you wanted to be with your friends, and for young shy, two years take away a lot of um, social um, important social engagement from them. So what we supposed to, I mean, as an architect, when we do the design, so now um, we supposed to think about like those, um, how to kind of adapt it, the new concern on the, um, on the basic um, way of life, way of living. I, I don't think that the designs of the building has to be such an um, extreme change but I think um, the materials and surfaces that allowed um, cleanliness and hygiene to perform is very important. Or sometimes if you if you think about like the device between the space and then normally traditionally we would just install those um, 
door handles, right? So now you can also use um, other techniques, how you can open the door, something like that. So I think it will be more of um, try to reduce the um, surfaces that uh, contaminate those um, germs and then try to be more hygiene, right? But um, we cannot be completely changed on how we, how we engage, how we involve with each other. Okay, so that was thank you for your answer. answer right? yeah. yeah, like for the next question that I wanted to ask also related to hygiene and um, for Professor Shui, you can answer this question as well. So my question is that in terms of sustainability, I think of like the waste problem during the COVID-19 situation, there is a lot of waste being produced from the testing lab, like the ATK test since it like non-reusable because it has involved with the infections. So how do you think architecture can help solving, solving this problem? Like in hygiene, you have to use a lot of materials to clean up things, right? Yeah, so I think of how architecture can help solving this problem. I think the summaries, Professor summaries also answered the question already that using <laughs> circular economy concept, I think that's a, we have already seen a lot of uh, reusing or refabricating or re reproduce the for example the medical mask there are a lot of uh, medical mask waste and and i already seen the design so some architects that design to recombine this medical mask into different material and they can be used in our everyday life so I think the circular economy is a uh, very key uh, strategies to deal with those waste issues. So in for the circular economy term, there, there's no waste at all. It's just a resource for other for other loops or for other uh, ecology ecological systems. So I think that's the the, the key key concept and key strategies. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I understand now. <laughs> Thank you for your answer. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else you would like to mention before we ending the sessions? I let um, Professor Shui first. Okay. No, no, so, so I, I also saw some good uh, comments or questions in the text. So I, I, I just want to uh, re, re center on the this resilient design concept. I, I, I agree with the the uh, currently the resilient design is very very important. Not only is we need this kind of uh, concept and to reinforce in the architectural practice or in the architectural education and in the school and and because we we need it for the pandemic. And we need it for the extreme weather, and so to create a better resilient urban design or the water systems. And and for Taiwan, probably not in Thailand. For Taiwan, we we are facing other crises from the geopolitical relationship. You know, the the, the China is shooting yes. the, the the missiles, and, yeah. and so we we need to be resilient in in many ways to to be to survive <laughs> <laughs> to, to be more uh, to have uh, more awareness so I, I think for the better future so it's, it's it's very important mm -hmm. that's it yeah yeah okay so um, for me i feel like um i always ask myself like um what's the purpose of life like why are we exist right why we why we have this kind of jobs right so i think um for for me is i think it's um we the existence of myself it's actually like i would like to contribute of what i learn of what i know in order to to support the societies or the um, communities or even the school that when whenever we have a crisis, then um, it was um, with our professions we can help the society, 
right? And then um, that's the purpose of um, if we enter this world, then we wanted to make sure when we leave this world, the world can remain a, a better place. Yeah, so that's that's what um, I'm truly um, believe in it, and then I try our best to to contribute to what we, whatever we have a chance to do so. Yeah. Thank you for your answer, and thank you both of you for um, sharing your comments or your thoughts on our that that helped clarify our curiosity. And yeah, and this is it for the our second episode of first webinar series. 2022 by School of Architecture and Design Architecture Program. Um, so thank you, Ms. Sunari Lawanyawat and Associate, Associate Professor Shenglun Shui for this very educational session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So coming to the end of this event, I believe everyone has learned so much from our lectures. Again, I would like to thank you everyone for joining and participate in our second episode of the webinar series. And don't forget to mark your calendar for the upcoming third episode about Design for Resilience on Friday, the 7th of October, 2022. And see you for the next event. Have a good day.